Now, my, my wife is in the back. She calls me David. But I always introduce myself as Dave. So when you see me and she's not with me, call me Dave. And if she is with me, call me Dave. Um, I teach at Indiana Wesleyan. I've done so since 2000. For about a five-year um, hiatus where Angie and I went up to Canada. And I was the academic dean at Kingswood University there. So as Hubert was talking about uh, how babies uh, cry, in Canada, babies cry, wah, eh? Let me give you just a, we'll be, we'll be talking about the story of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, don't hear me say the word story like it's uninspired. Hear me tell, well, when my son was young, um, I always had the joy of putting him to bed. And I always told him a story. That was the way we went to bed. And often it was a Bible story. And this is the way Josh always said it. Dad, tell me a story, but please get me into it. <laughs> That's the Gospel of Mark. It is the story of Jesus. And he wants us to enter into that journey with him. You are not to read it as a distant observer being a long way off overseeing this. You are to identify yourself with the disciples or with maybe one of the women or maybe one of the crowd. Um, hopefully you won't identify yourself as Judas, <laughs> but you may actually identify yourself as Peter. And if you really ask, who is the bad guy in the Gospel of Mark? It's not Judas. It is Peter. The ancient church tells us that the, the gospel writer Mark was not an apostle. He was not there. The ancient church tells us Mark actually wrote down the sermons of Peter. So the gospel of Mark is the story of Jesus as told by Peter, and he knows that he is the chief of all sinners. So you may not want to be Judas. You probably also don't want to be Peter. Though a number of us do say that, I'm stubborn just like Peter. That's not a good trait. Uh, we heard about the humble God, and we're formed in the image of God. Don't be like Peter. Be like Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we enter into your word, and I ask that uh, you would hide all of us behind the cross. As we open up this text, may we hold it as dear as it is, your voice to our ears. It is in your name we pray. Amen. And she waved back there, because I know you can't see me very well. Um, this woman back here is the person that introduced me to Jesus. For 25 years, I was, I was a practicing sinner, and I was getting pretty good at it. Drugs and alcohol was all that I cared about. And uh, one day I was at work, I was actually working in downtown Columbus, Ohio, Nationwide Insurance. I was a computer programmer. And don't, don't think that uh, computer programmers need to have any kind of sensibility about them. Um, all you're doing with a computer is telling it whether it's on or off. So you can do drugs and alcohol all day long and still be a programmer. Um, Angie walked past my desk. Have you ever seen the cartoon Dilbert? You know Dilbert who sat in a cubicle? That was me. I was a programmer coding, and she walked by my desk. I didn't smell her perfume. I actually heard her, now I don't know if this is dating us, but she had what she calls Barbie doll shoes. No back to them. When you walk, they flip. flip, flip. So it's like uh, flip-flops with high, with high heels on. And she walked by, I heard it, and I rolled my chair out, looked down the aisle and saw her, she had a hot pink dress on. And I actually prayed for the first time. I said, oh my God. <laughs> I followed after her, went to her desk, and invited her out on a date, just like that. Um, she said no. Good sensibility on her. She said no six more times. I didn't know that seven was a holy number. <laughs> 
But on the seventh time, she said, okay, and I knew she was just trying to get rid of me. Okay, here was her line. I'll only go out with you if you go to church with me. <laughs> I'd never been to church in my life. I thought, that's great. You show me your world, and then after church, I'll show you my world, and we'll see who wins. <laughs> it was a Friday. Um, and if you drink a lot, um, every Friday is a good Friday. <laughs> but this happened to be the church's good Friday. We went to church, we drove to the parking lot, um, and I was amazed because the parking lot was packed. I thought, what's the matter with these Christians going to church on Friday? Then she actually told me she also goes to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Wow, what a boring life that must be. Right into church. Um, this was in 1981. So the main instrument, there was no drums, there was an organ. And on some days there was a piano and an organ, but always the organ, which I thought was pretty great because the organ you always hear in baseball games and hockey games. So this is going to be a fun evening. <laughs> <laughs> Took out the hymnal, had no idea what to do with that. I mean, hymnals need to have an operator's manual with them. I don't even know where to turn. I don't even know how you sing verses. And then the pastor got up to preach. And he opened the Bible to what he said was the Gospel of Mark. Good Friday. He's preaching on Mark chapter 15. And he began telling the story of Jesus. And somehow, this man got me into the story. But I kept turning and looking at Angie because he was declaring things from the pulpit that was about me. And I kept looking at her thinking, you've told him this, and now he's talking about me publicly in front of everybody else. I was afraid of when I heard what this term was. If you've, done, if you've had problems with drugs, you also sell a lot of drugs. And Angie was explaining to me, oh, you're under conviction which is never a great word. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the message, um, I was lost. I mean, I knew I was lost. I really didn't know how to get found, and that was not part of the end of the message. But I asked Angie, I wanted to take her out truly and wine her and dine her. Instead, we went to her grandmother's house, because that's where she was living. We sat on an old rickety couch, and here were these words I said to her, and they still seem surreal to this day. Could you please show me where this Mark guy is? Because I just have to read it for myself. So, I apologize in advance if at all this week I seem somewhat passionate about Mark. Because Mark changed my life. Amen. Now, I, I, I know, yeah, and you do too, I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's what this book has done to me. And so I just made it um, my gospel. Now, if you want it to become your gospel, I will share with you. My mom and dad taught me to do that. They didn't teach me about church or about Jesus. That was my life. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Enough said right there. Verse 1. Now, believe it or not, tomorrow I'll probably spend most of the time unpacking that one verse. Because if you get that verse right, Everything that follows makes perfect sense. But I will tell you, if you get that verse wrong, nothing will make sense. Well, you will make Mark conform to your world. I'm asking you this week, conform yourself to his world and his view of Jesus. That's what's transforming. One of the it's not a problem in the evangelical church, and I don't mean evangelical church in terms of your church, I mean the generic evangelical church. We have what's called the sanctification gap. Richard Lovelace in 1973 wrote an article entitled The Sanctification Gap. 
And what he was describing is what we all know. There is a gap between what we understand as salvation and what Jesus offers to us as fullness in Christ. I think one of our problems is we've become, we've created a very, very wide entrance into the church. So much so that it's as simple as this. Just answer the four spiritual laws. Answer yes, 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 and you are in. And then the question becomes, would you like to grow in grace and become a disciple? Like that's an option. No, I'd rather not. Okay, you're fine. John Wesley said that for the church to change the world, here, for the church to change the world, we don't make converts, we make disciples. And we followed a model of ministry that is about evangelism first and discipleship as an option to be added on. I just don't find that in the scriptures. <coughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when God calls a man, he calls him or a woman to come and to die. And so, maybe today, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, I might offer you a gospel <coughs> that is hard to get into. But once you do, you find out it is utterly transformative. That's my offer. That's Mark. There is nothing safe about this book. It's the most dangerous book in the world. Because Jesus is claiming death for himself. And he actually says, come, follow me. And if your option is, no, I don't like that, then you are rejecting Jesus. It is a dangerous book. <coughs> Let me give you just a little bit of background. The Gospel of Mark. Uh, probably the earliest gospel actually written. Now, you do realize that from the time of Jesus' death, probably around 30 A.D., so the writing of the first gospel, not the writing of Paul's first letters, the writing of the first gospel was probably about 35 years. So maybe around 65 to 68 AD, the gospel of Mark was actually written down. But it was in oral form. I mean, it was told as a story. Um, you couldn't have witnessed some of Jesus' miracles and not told them as stories of the territory from where you were. If Jesus came to your town and did a miracle, you would tell that story again and again and again. And these stories were sacred. They were not ones that would ever change. They would be the same. Our problem is we live in a literary culture where we see the text physically written. Not so in Jesus' day, not so in Mark's day. It was an oral culture. O-R-A-L. Which meant, well, let me give you an example. In a, in a, let's, let's say we are a village, if we can be. Um, there would be one person in the village that could actually read one. The illiteracy rate in the ancient world was at least 90%, if not higher. So in our group, there would be one, maybe two people that could actually read. That would be all. So when you come to, on a Sabbath day to hear a text like Mark read, you would all come because you have not been able to hear it at all, all week long. You all have Bibles sitting in front of you, but the Bible would do you no good if you could not read. Plus, it was so expensive you could not afford it. So you would come on a Sabbath day to hear the Gospel. Now, in many evangelical churches these days, um, our, our, what a great, we actually got to hear an entire psalm read yesterday evening. Um, very often now, we hear just a couple of verses, and then we hear the pastor for 30 minutes. In the ancient world, you would actually hear the Gospel of Mark read. I don't mean Mark 1 and Mark 1 and 2. I mean Mark, the whole book. What else do you have to do? 
You come to church to visit with God. You do realize that it was not until the 16th century, 1521 and 1549 to be exact, when the chapters and verses were put into the Bible. Before that, you just read Mark. Don't we count ourselves spiritual when we're reading at least one chapter a day? Can I, uh, I am a professor. I do this professionally. So can I give you an assignment? I would love at some point during our time together, when there's a hole in your schedule, give it to Mark. Sit down. It's going to be a hot afternoon, so probably in air conditioning, with coffee, preferably. <laughs> read Mark. Just read Mark. It'll take you 90 minutes. But if you read Mark from beginning to end in one sitting, it'll change the way you hear the story. As we read it in little bite-sized chunks, a couple of verses, maybe a chapter, and you, you lose the flow of the story, let me encourage you to read Mark like the early church did. And then, of course, those people actually gave their lives for Jesus. I wonder what it was that caused them to be so fully devoted that they actually understood the story and internalized that it became their story. Not Mark's, theirs. Like it became mine. It must become yours. Read Mark as a whole. Um, I'll do a little bit of preparation for you to do that this morning on how to be able to see the, the major movements in the book so you can see its flow. Because Mark is what's called an episodic story. In the ancient world, um, people took these stories one after another after, and chained them together. That's what the gospel is. Our problem is we want to be told how all of these stories relate to each other. That's your job, not Mark's job. Now, if it's okay for me to say, we are lazy readers. Yes. We want to be told what it means. I want you to discover what it means. Because when you discover it, it becomes yours. We want to be sat back and told what to believe. No, I want you to dig so the truth comes out. God is the one that converses with you. Am I making sense? So reading Mark, you're, you're going to be a little, at times, not confused, but you're just a little, how does this story relate to this one? Dig and find out. Become a student of the world. So the gospel is episodic in the way it's put together, one after another after another. And as you begin to uncover how these episodes actually go together, you will be amazed. Um, there was a modern writer in the 1960s that was writing on the Gospel of Mark and said these, these words, it is the clumsiest of the four Gospels. <laughs> Clumsy. I've never used that word in Scripture, but he did it. Um, here was what he was saying. St. Luke was probably the best educated of the Gospel writers. Actually writes in the best Greek. He is a good writer. Luke is meant to be read. Matthew. Matthew is a well-written gospel. Actually, Matthew contains 95% of Mark, but Matthew is actually like a professor. Matthew actually corrects the grammar of Mark. It's like Matthew has the red letter, and I'm going to be correcting me. I mean, Mark actually writes like a person speaks um, in the cafeteria. I imagine that a number of you will be talking during lunch. I mean, is, is, is that part of tradition here at camp? That you eat and talk at the same time? And here's my guess. None of you over the lunch hour will use more than 800 different vocabulary words. You don't talk like you write. You talk to communicate. And you talk to be understood. That's Mark's gospel. It's not clumsy. 
It's an intentionally written to be heard. Not to read, but to hear. And notice this afternoon when you're reading it, the number of times it will say, you that have ears to hear, let them hear. Because here's the problem with most of us. We are deaf. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question. Now, I want you to close your eyes for a second. And I'm going to say a name, and I want you to picture this person. And I know all of you will be able to do this. On three. One, two, three. SpongeBob. Can you see him? Yeah, some of you are going, I see him, I don't want to. <laughs> okay, open your eyes. What is the problem with SpongeBob receiving the gospel? <laughs> he has no ears. That is every human being. You are born a spiritual blockhead. <laughs> Would you do me a favor? In your, in your Bibles, turn to Psalm 90. Psalm 9. Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Psalm 40, you probably know well. You know the first uh, six or eight verses of this very well. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me, and He heard my cry. So you know God's got ears, right? He heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon the rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in God. Verse 4. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O oh my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare to you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, it would be more than could be counted. Now listen to verse 6. Sacrifice and burnt offerings you do not desire. Or stop for a second. I don't know whether or not any of you had uh, uh, devotions in Leviticus today, <laughs> but Leviticus would contradict that statement. You do want burnt offerings and sacrifices. I read it again and again and again. This is the psalmist way of making hyperbole, an exaggeration. It's not that you don't want this. You want something more than that. You have, let's see. Sacrifice and burnt offerings you do not desire, but you have given me, now this is this text, an open ear. That's a nice kind of domesticated way of translating this phrase. Um, some of you have different translations than the NRSV. Shout out how that is translated for you. <coughs> now that you have made me listen. Yeah, now that you've made me listen, what you, else? You've opened my ears. You've, so opened, you've opened my ears. Does anybody have a translation that says, my ears you have pierced? Yes. Okay, let me take you back about 15 years. I was sitting in my office in Indiana West. I was the chair of the School of Theology and Ministry. So every student being ordained was kind of going through my office. Um, a student <coughs> came in, and at that point at Indiana Wesleyan, if you were on a, a service team, a ministry team for the school, you could not, as a male, have pierced ears. He came running into my office with this text. He says, look, God wants my ears pierced. <laughs> I said, that would be great if that's what the text actually said. <laughs> there is a wonderful word for pierced ear. You probably know this from the Old Testament. When you were a slave, <coughs> slave was, slavery is very different in the ancient world than we have in our culture. 
So assume you are so poor you cannot care for yourself. You actually give yourself to slavery to somebody that has more than you, and they care for you. And they care for you so well, it's like you're their adopted child. And you actually had a right to the Old Testament where you could take your ear, put it down on a piece of wood, and this master would take an awe, imagine a, a, a pick, and pierce your ear then. You would be his for a lifetime by your choice. That's a great word for pierced. Not this one. The only time this word occurs is in the book of Genesis. When the Philistines have filled up all of the wells of Abraham, where God then declares to them, I want you to go and dig out these wells so that clean water can now be given again. That's the word. It says, the sacrifices and burnt offerings you did not desire, but my ears you have dug out. Without God coming and digging out your ears, you have no way of hearing his voice. And the gospel in the ancient world was always a oral event. Always heard. I was preaching in a youth camp trying to get this point across didn't go into quite as much detail as it just did with you. Um, but here's what I said. In the ancient world, uh, the scriptures were always heard. They were read by a reader, but then pronounced. So they became words that didn't just go directly to your ears, but bounced off the wall, became a part of this event. So it was seen with the eyes. It was pronounced with the voice. It is heard with the ears. And translate it to the heart. I said it this way. Reading the scriptures in the ancient world was a sensual event. I didn't mean sensual, I meant sensory. But when I said sensual, all the teenagers heard that. You could see their voices say, like, I want that. <laughs> so can I give you a different <clears throat> don't just read the text this afternoon. Read it aloud. Allow your voice to inhabit the words of Mark. Allow your voice to be heard by another. Don't read it alone. Read it with someone else. Allow someone else to watch at times. When I'm reading the Gospel of Mark, you'll be able to tell this week when I come to a passage that is deeply affected because when I read it, my voice changes. And it ceases to be the word of the Lord, and it becomes the word of David. It becomes this thing that has transformed my life from drugs and alcohol to be crazy for Jesus. And be in the best of Jesus. So maybe this afternoon, if you could slow it down a little bit, in some sort of community setting, Read the gospel aloud to one another. And allow it not just to inhabit your, your <coughs> eyes and not just your mind, but your lips, <coughs> your ears, your community that you're in. Allow it to be a first century sensory experience. It'll take you a little bit longer to read it allowed than it will to read it silently. When I was in first grade, I was learning to read. And I am, when you get to know me, you'll know I'm just not the brightest of all people. I am very slow. And so what I used to do when I would read would actually be to um, move my lips as I read. And I had a teacher in first grade her name was Mrs. Noon, N-O-O-N. In case you were wondering, she was the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> she had a metal ruler, 18 inches long, and she knew how to use it. 
<laughs> and actually, in those days, corporal punishment, some of you that are younger don't, don't understand the term corporal punishment. She was allowed to yeah. use it. She was encouraged to use it. <laughs> and when I should walk by my desk, I would be lip syncing <laughs> the words, and she would hold my hand out. No, no, not that oh. way. This way. Slap it with the metal ruler. Stop doing that, young man. Oh, was right. Because <laughs> here's what she was saying to me. You can be better educated if you can consume more material. Because when you move your lips, it slows down your ability to read. She made the assumption, if you consume more material, you'll be better educated. I don't want you to consume more material. I want you to be consumed. Material. So slow down. Open the Gospel of Mark up and read it. If it causes you to slow down, good. So it'll probably take you two hours. So, if it's going to take you two hours, read from Mark 1 to the end of Mark chapter 8, because that's the best breaking point. And then begin at 9 and read the rest. Break it into two sections, but I promise you something. And I don't promise a lot. If you read it aloud in community, you will hear things that you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me, uh, if I can, I'm going to use, I'm using Hubert's computer and click. So um, let's, I want to talk to you about the first half of the Gospel of Mark and the second half. So if, I am, if I'm preaching a sermon series, well, like teaching um, a Bible study on the Gospel of Mark, you might ask the question, there's 16 chapters. How are you going to choose which pas passages to teach and which ones to ignore? Usually it's been, these are my favorite ones. I'm going to teach the one I like and then the ones I don't like. No, I'm going to teach the ones that Mark wants you to focus on so that you will be able to understand what he is talking about. There are, I would argue, three main themes that arise in the Gospel of Mark. There's a number of, of subcategories, but three main themes. The first is introduction. The first 13 verses introduces everything about the Gospel of Mark. Now, it's not like the rest is just uh, um, superfluous. But the first 13 verses, and that's all we're going to talk about tomorrow, the first 13 verses. And you will tell by the time I get done tomorrow, I've still only scratched the surface. But the first 13 verses introduce the plot, introduces all of the characters and many of the places that are going to occur in the Gospel of Mark. So very often, I mean, I get this as a professor all the time. Students will be assigned a textbook. And they can be so technical when it comes to fulfilling the letter of the law. Do I have to read the introduction to, or can I just begin with chapter one? You don't have to read chapter one, but chapter one's gonna tell you how to read the rest of the book. So if you want to ignore all the 